The affair at the bungalow. I have thought of something, said Jane Helia. Her beautiful face was lit up with the confident smile of a child expecting approbation. It was a smile such as moved audiences nightly in London, and which had made the fortunes of photographers. It happened, she went on carefully, to a friend of mine. Everyone made encouraging but slightly hypocritical noises. Colonel Bantry, Mrs. Bantry, Sir Henry Clithering, Dr. Lloyd and old Miss Marple were one and all convinced that Jane's friend was Jane herself. She would have been quite incapable of remembering or taking an interest in anything affecting anyone else. My friend went on Jane. I won't mention her name, was an actress, a very well-known actress. No one expressed surprise. Sir Henry Clithering thought to himself, now I wonder how many sentences it will be before she forgets to keep up the fiction, and says, I, instead of, she. My friend was on tour in the provinces, this was a year or two ago. I suppose I'd better not give the name of the place. It was a riverside town not very far from London. I'll call it. She paused, her brows perplexed in thought. The invention of even a simple name appeared to be too much for her. Sir Henry came to the rescue. Shall we call it Riverbury? He suggested gravely. Oh, yes, that would do splendidly. Riverbury, I'll remember that. Well, as I say, this my friend was at Riverbury with her company, and a very curious thing happened. She puckered her brows again. It's very difficult, she said plaintively, to say just what you want. One gets things mixed up and tells the wrong things first. You are doing it beautifully, said Dr. Lloyd encouragingly. Go on. Well, this curious thing happened. My friend was sent for to the police station. And she went. It seemed there had been a burglary at a riverside bungalow and they would arrested a young man, and he told a very odd story. And so they sent for her. She would never been to a police station before, but they were very nice to her, very nice indeed. They would be, I'm sure, said Sir Henry. The sergeant, I think it was a sergeant or it may have been an inspector gave her a chair and explained things, and of course I saw at once that it was some mistake. Aha, uh -huh, thought Sir Henry. I hear we are. I thought as much. My friend said so, continued Jane serenely unconscious of her self-betrayal. She explained she had been rehearsing with her understudy at the hotel and that she would never even heard of this Mr. Tolkiener. And the sergeant said, Miss Hale. She stopped and flushed. Miss Hellman, suggested Sir Henry with a twinkle. Yes, yes, that would do. Thank you, he said. Well, Miss Hellman, I felt it must be some mistake knowing that you were stopping at the Bridge Hotel, and he said would I have any objection to confronting or was it being confronted? I can't remember. It doesn't really matter, said Sir Henry reassuringly. Anyway, with the young man. So I said, of course not. And they brought him and said, this is Miss Helia, and oh. Jane broke off open mouth. Never mind, my dear said Miss Marple consolingly. We were bound to guess, you know. And you haven't given us the name of the place or anything that really matters. Well, said Jane. I did mean to tell it as though it happened to someone else. But it is difficult, isn't it? I mean one forgets so. Everyone assured her that it was very difficult, and soothed and reassured, she went on with her slightly involved narrative. He was a nice-looking man, quite a nice-looking man. Young, with reddish hair. His mouth just opened when he saw me. And the sergeant said, Is this the lady? And he said, No, indeed it isn't. What an ass I have been. And I smiled at him and said it didn't matter. I can picture the scene, said Sir Henry. Jane Halia frowned. Let me see how had I better go on. Supposing you tell us what it was all about, dear, said Miss Marple, 
so mildly that no one could suspect her of irony. I mean what the young man's mistake was, and about the burglary. Oh, yes, said Jane. Well, you see, this young man Leslie Tolkiener, his name was had written a play. He'd written several plays, as a matter of fact, though none of them had ever been taken. And he had sent this particular play to me to read. I didn't know about it, because of course I have hundreds of plays sent to me and I read very few of them myself only the ones I know something about. Anyway, there it was, and it seems that Mr. Tolkiener got a letter from me only it turned out not to be really from me you understand. She paused anxiously, and they assured her that they understood. Saying that I'd read the play, and liked it very much and would he come down and talk it over with me and it gave the address the bungalow, Riverbury. So Mr. Tolkiener was frightfully pleased and he came down and arrived at this place, the bungalow. A parlour maid opened the door, and he asked for Miss Helia, and she said Miss Helia was in and expecting him and showed him into the drawing room, and there a woman came to him. And he accepted her as me as a matter of course which seems queer because after all he had seen me act and my photographs are very well known, aren't they? Over the length and breadth of England, said Mrs. Bantry promptly. But there's often a lot of difference between a photograph and its original, my dear Jane. And there's a great deal of difference between behind the footlights and off the stage. It's not every actress who stands the test as well as you do, remember. Well, said Jane slightly mollified, that may be so. Anyway. He described this woman as tall and fair with big blue eyes and very good looking, so I suppose it must have been near enough. He certainly had no suspicions. She sat down and began talking about his play and said she was anxious to do it. Whilst they were talking cocktails were brought in and Mr. Tolkiener had one as a matter of course. Well that's all he remembers having this cocktail. When he woke up, or came to himself, or whatever you call it he was lying out in the road, by the hedge, of course, so that there would be no danger of his being run over. He felt very queer and shaky so much so that he just got up and staggered along the road not quite knowing where he was going. He said if he'd had his sense about him he'd have gone back to the bungalow and tried to find out what had happened. But he felt just stupid and maced and walked along without quite knowing what he was doing. He was just more or less coming to himself when the police arrested him. Why did the police arrest him? asked Dr. Lloyd. Oh, didn't I tell you, said Jane opening her eyes very wide. How very stupid I am. The burglary. You mentioned the burglary but you didn't say where or what or why, said Mrs. Bantry. Well, this bungalow the one he went to, of course it wasn't mine at all. It belonged to a man whose name was. Again Jane furrowed her brows. Do you want me to be godfather again? asked Sir Henry. Pseudonyms supplied free of charge. Describe the tenant and I'll do the naming. It was taken by a rich city man a night. Sir Herman Cohen, suggested Sir Henry. That will do beautifully. He took it for a lady she was the wife of an actor and she was also an actress herself. We'll call the actor Cloud Leeson, said Sir Henry, and the lady would be known by her stage name, I suppose, so we'll call her Miss Mary Kerr. I think you are awfully clever, said Jane. I don't know how you think of these things so easily. Well, you see this was a sort of weekend cottage for Sir Herman did you say Herman? And the lady. And, of course, his wife knew nothing about it. Which is so often the case, said Sir Henry. And he'd given this actress woman a good deal of jewellery including some very fine emeralds. Ah, uh, said Dr. Lloyd. Now we are getting at it. This jewellery was at the bungalow, just locked up in a jewel case. The police said it was very careless and even might have taken it. You see, Dolly, said Colonel Bantry. What do I always tell you? Well, in my experience, said Mrs. Bantry, it's always the people who are so dreadfully careful who lose things.
I don't lock mine up in a jewel case, I keep it in a drawer loose, under my stockings. I dare say if what's her name? Mary Care had done the same, it would never have been stolen. It would, said Jane, because all the drawers were burst open, and the contents strewn about. Then they weren't really looking for jewels, said Mrs. Bantry. They were looking for secret papers. That's what always happens in books. I don't know about secret papers, said Jane doubtfully. I never heard of any. Don't be distracted. Miss Helia, said Colonel Bantry. Dolly's wild red herrings are not to be taken seriously. About the burglary, said Sir Henry. Yes. Well, the police were rung up by someone who said she was Miss Mary Kerr. She said the bungalow had been burgled and described a young man with red hair who had called there that morning. Her maid had thought there was something odd about him and had refused him admittance, but later they had seen him getting out through a window. She described the man so accurately that the police arrested him only an hour later and then he told his story and showed them the letter from me. And as I told you, they fetched me and when he saw me he said what I told you that it hadn't been me at all. A very curious story, said Dr. Lloyd. Did Mr. Tolkiener know this Miss Care? No, he didn't or he said he didn't. But I haven't told you the most curious part yet. The police went to the bungalow of course, and they found everything as described drawers pulled out and jewels gone, but the whole place was empty. It wasn't till some hours later that Mary Care came back. And when she did she said she would never run them up at all and this was the first she would heard of it. It seemed that she had had a wire that morning from a manager offering her a most important part and making an appointment, so she had naturally rushed up to town to keep it. When she got there, she found that the whole thing was a hoax. No telegram had ever been sent. A common enough ruse to get her out of the way, commented Sir Henry. What about the servants? The same sort of thing happened there. There was only one, and she was rung up on the telephone apparently by Mary Care, who said she had left a most important thing behind. She directed the maid to bring up a certain handbag which was in the drawer of her bedroom. She was to catch the first train. The maid did so, of course locking up the house, but when she arrived at Miss Care's club, where she had been told to meet her mistress, she waited there in vain. H.M., said Sir Henry. I begin to see. The house was left empty, and to make an entry by one of the windows would present few difficulties, I should imagine. But I don't quite see where Mr. Tolkiener comes in. Who did ring up the police? if it wasn't Miss Care. That's what nobody knew or ever found out. Curious, said Sir Henry. Did the young man turn out to be genuinely the person he said he was? Oh, yes, that part of it was all right. He'd even got the letter which was supposed to be written by me. It wasn't the least bit like my handwriting but then, of course, he couldn't be supposed to know that. Well, Let's state the position clearly, said Sir Henry. Correct me if I go wrong. The lady and the maid are decoded from the house. This young man is decoded down there by means of a bogus letter color being lent to this last by the fact that you actually are performing at Riverbury that week. The young man is doped, and the police are rung up and have their suspicions directed against him. A burglary actually has taken place. I presume the jewels were taken. Oh, yes. Were they ever recovered? No, never. I think, as a matter of fact, Sir Herman tried to hosh things up all he knew how. But he couldn't manage it and I rather fancy his wife started divorce proceedings in consequence. Still, I don't really know about that. What happened to Mr. Leslie Tolkiener? He was released in the end. The police said they hadn't really got enough against him. Don't you think the whole thing was rather odd? Distantly odd. The first question is whose story to believe.
in telling if Miss Helia, I noticed that you inclined towards believing Mr. Tolkiener. Have you any reason for doing so beyond your own instinct in the matter? No, no, said Jane unwillingly. I suppose I haven't. But he was so very nice, and so apologetic for having mistaken anyone else for me, that I feel sure he must have been telling the truth. I see, said Sir Henry smiling. But you must admit that he could have invented the story quite easily. He could write the letter purporting to be from you himself. He could also dope himself after successfully committing the burglary. But I confess I don't see where the point of all that would be. Easier to enter the house, help himself, and disappear quietly unless just possibly he was observed by someone in the neighborhood and knew himself to have been observed. Then he might hastily concoct this plan for diverting suspicion from himself and accounting for his presence in the neighborhood. Was he well off? asked Miss Marple. I don't think so, said Jane. No, I believe he was rather hard up. The whole thing seems curious, said Dr. Lloyd. I must confess that if we accept the young man's story as true, it seems to make the case very much more difficult. Why should the unknown woman who pretended to be Miss Helia drag this unknown man into the affair? Why should she stage such an elaborate comedy? Tell me, Jane, said Mrs. Bantry. Did young Tolkiener ever come face to face with Mary Kerr at any stage of the proceedings? I don't quite know, said Jane slowly, as she puzzled her brows in remembrance. Because if he didn't the case is solved, said Mrs. Bantry. I'm sure I'm right what is easier than to pretend you are called up to town. You telephone to your maid from Paddington or whatever station you arrive at, and as she comes up to town, you go down again. The young man calls by appointment, he is doped, you set the stage for the burglary, overdoing it as much as possible. You telephone the police, give a description of your scapegoat, and off you go to town again. Then you arrive home by a later train and do the surprised innocent. But why should she steal her own jewels, Dolly? They always do, said Mrs. Bantry. And anyway, I can think of hundreds of reasons. She may have wanted money at once old Sir Herman wouldn't give her the cash, perhaps, so she pretends the jewels are stolen and then sells them secretly. Or she may have been being blackmailed by someone who threatened to tell her husband or Sir Herman's wife. Or she may have already sold the jewels and Sir Herman was getting ratty and asking to see them, so she had to do something about it. That's done a good deal in books. Or perhaps she was going to have them reset and she would got paste replicas. Or here is a very good idea and not so much done in books she pretends they are stolen, gets in an awful state and he gives her a fresh lot. So she gets two lots instead of one. That kind of woman, I am sure, is most frightfully artful. You are clever, Dolly, said Jane admiringly. I never thought of that. You may be clever, but she doesn't say you are right, said Colonel Bantry. I incline to suspicion of the city gentleman. He'd know the sort of telegram to get the lady out of the way and he could manage the rest easily enough with the help of a new lady friend. Nobody seems to have thought of asking him for an alibi. What do you think, Miss Marple? asked Jane, turning towards the old lady who had sat silent, a puzzled frown on her face. My dear, I really don't know what to say. Sir Henry will laugh, but I recall no village parallel to help me this time. Of course there are several questions that suggest themselves. For instance, the servant question. In a hem and irregular menage of the kind you describe, the servant employed would doubtless be perfectly aware of the state of things, and a really nice girl would not take such a place her mother wouldn't let her for a minute. So I think we can assume that the maid was not a really trustworthy character. She may have been in league with the thieves. She would leave the house open for them and actually go to London as though sure of the pretense telephone message so as to divert suspicion from herself. I must confess that that seems the most probable solution. Only if ordinary thieves were concerned it seems very odd. It seems to argue more knowledge than a maidservant was likely to have. Miss Marple paused and then went on dreamily.
I can't help feeling that there was some well, what I must describe as personal feeling about the whole thing. Supposing somebody had a spite, for instance, a young actress that he hadn't treated well. Don't you think that that would explain things better? A deliberate attempt to get him into trouble. That's what it looks like. And yet that's not entirely satisfactory. Why, doctor, you haven't said anything, said Jane. I'd forgotten you. I'm always getting forgotten, said the grizzled doctor sadly. I must have a very inconspicuous personality. Oh, no, said Jane. Do tell us what you think. I'm rather in the position of agreeing with everyone's solutions and yet with none of them. I myself have a far-fetched and probably totally erroneous theory that the wife may have had something to do with it. Sir Herman's wife, I mean. I have no grounds for thinking so only you would be surprised if you knew the extraordinary really very extraordinary things that a wronged wife will take it into her head to do. Oh. Dr. Lloyd, cried Miss Marple excitedly. How clever of you. And I never thought of poor Mrs. Pibmers. Jane stared at her. Mrs. Pibmers. Who is Mrs. Pibmers? Well, Miss Marple hesitated. I don't know that she really comes in. She's a laundress. And she stole an opal pin that was pinned into a blouse and put it in another woman's house. Jane looked more fogged than ever. And that makes it all perfectly clear to you, Miss Marple, said Sir Henry, with his twinkle. But to his surprise Miss Marple shook her head. No, I'm afraid it doesn't. I must confess myself completely at a loss. What I do realize is that women must stick together one should, in an emergency, stand by one's own sex. I think that's the moral of the story Miss Helia has told us. I must confess that that particular ethical significance of the mystery has escaped me, said Sir Henry gravely. Perhaps I shall see the significance of your point more clearly when Miss Helia has revealed the solution. Eh, said Jane looking rather bewildered. I was observing that. In childish language, we, give it up. You and you alone, Miss Helia, have had the high honor of presenting such an absolutely baffling mystery that even Miss Marple has to confess herself defeated. You all give it up? asked Jane. Yes. After a minute's silence during which he waited for the others to speak, Sir Henry constituted himself spokesman once more. That is to say we stand or fall by the sketchy solutions we have tentatively advanced. One each for the mere men, two for Miss Marple, and a round dozen from Mrs. B. It was not a dozen, said Mrs. Bantry. They were variations on a main theme. And how often am I to tell? You that I will not be called Mrs. B. So you all give it up, said Jane thoughtfully. That's very interesting. She leaned back in her chair and began to polish her nails rather absent-mindedly. Well, said Mrs. Bantry. Come on, Jane. What is the solution? The solution? Yes. What really happened? Jane stared at her. I haven't the least idea. What? I have always wondered. I thought you were all so clever one of you would be able to tell me. Everybody harbored feelings of annoyance. It was all very well for Jane to be so beautiful but at this moment everyone felt that stupidity could be carried too far. Even the most transcendent loveliness could not excuse it. You mean the truth was never discovered, said Sir Henry. No. That's why, as I say, I did think you would be able to tell me. Jane sounded injured. It was plain that she had a grievance. Well I'm I'm, said Colonel Bantry, words failing him. You are the most aggravating girl, Jane, said his wife. Anyway, I'm sure and always will be that I was right. If you just tell us the proper names of the people, I shall be quite sure. I don't think I could do that, said Jane slowly. No, dear, said Miss Marple. Miss Helia couldn't do that. Of course she could said Mrs. Bantry. Don't be so high-minded, Jane. We older folk must have a bit of scandal.
at any rate tell us who the city magnate was. But Jane shook her head, and Miss Marple, in her old-fashioned way, continued to support the girl. It must have been a very distressing business, she said. No, said Jane truthfully. I think I think I rather enjoyed it. Well, perhaps you did, said Miss Marple. I suppose it was a break in the monotony. What play were you acting in? Smith. Oh, yes. That's one of Mr. Somerset Modem's, isn't it? All his are very clever, I think. I have seen them nearly all. You are reviving it to go on to next autumn, aren't you? asked Mrs. Bantry. Jane nodded. Well, said Miss Marple rising. I must go home. Such late hours. But we have had a very entertaining evening. Most unusually so. I think Miss Haley's story wins the prize. Don't you agree? I'm sorry you are angry with me, said Jane. About not knowing the end, I mean. I suppose I should have said so sooner. Her tone sounded wistful. Dr. Lloyd rose gallantly to the occasion. My dear young lady, why should you? You gave us a very pretty problem to sharpen our wits on. I am only sorry we could none of us solve it convincingly. Speak for yourself, said Mrs. Bantry. I did solve it, I am convinced I am right. Do you know, I really believe you are, said Jane. What you said sounded so probable. Which of her seven solutions do you refer to? asked Sir Henry teasingly. Dr. Lloyd gallantly assisted Miss Marple to put on her galoshes. Just in case, as the old lady explained. The doctor was to be her escort to her old world cottage. Wrapped in several woolen shawls, Miss Marple wished everyone good night once more. She came to Jane Haley last and leaning forward, she murmured something in the actress's ear. A startled, oh, burst from Jane so loud as to cause the others to turn their heads. Smiling and nodding. Miss Marple made her exit, Jane Hellier staring after her. Are you coming to bed, Jane? asked Mrs. Bantry. What's the matter with you? You are staring as though you'd seen a ghost. With a deep sigh Jane came to herself, shed a beautiful and bewildering smile on the two men and followed her hostess up the staircase. Mrs. Bantry came into the girl's room with her. Your fire's nearly out, said Mrs. Bantry, giving it a vicious and ineffectual poke. They can't have made it up properly. How stupid housemaids are. Still, I suppose we are rather late tonight. Why, it's actually past one o'clock. Do you think there are many people like her? asked Jane Hellier. She was sitting on the side of the bed apparently wrapped in thought. Like the housemaid. No. Like that funny old woman what's her name Marple. Oh. I don't know. I suppose she's a fairly common type in a small village. Oh dear, said Jane. I don't know what to do. She sighed deeply. What's the matter? I'm worried. What about? Dolly? Jane Hellier was portentously solemn. Do you know what that queer old lady whispered to me before she went out of the door tonight? No. What? She said, I shouldn't do it if I were you, my dear. Never put yourself too much in another woman's power, even if you do think she's your friend at the moment. You know, Dolly, that's awfully true. The maxim. Yes, perhaps it is. But I don't see the application. I suppose you can't ever really trust a woman. And I should be in her power. I never thought of that. What woman are you talking about? Netta Green, my understudy. What on earth does Miss Marple know about your understudy? I suppose she guessed but I can't see how. Jane, will you kindly tell me at once what you are talking about? The story. The one I told. Oh, Dolly, that woman, you know the one that took Cloud from me. Mrs. Bantry nodded, casting her mind back rapidly to the first of Jane's unfortunate marriages to Cloud Overbury, the actor. He married her, 
and I could have told him how it would be. Cloud doesn't know, but she's carrying on with Sir Joseph Salmon weekends with him at the bungalow I told you about I wanted her shown up I would like everyone to know die sort of woman she was. And you see, with the burglary, everything would be bound to come out. Jane, gasped Mrs. Bantry. Did you engineer this story you have been telling us? Jane nodded. That's why I chose Smith. I wear parlor maid's kit in it, you know. So I should have it handy. And when they sent for me to the police station it's the easiest thing in the world to say I was rehearsing my part with my understudy at the hotel. Really, of course, we would be at the bungalow. I just have to open the door and bring in the cocktails, and Netta to pretend to be me. He'd never see her again, of course so there would be no fear of his recognizing her. And I can make myself look quite different as a parlor maid, and besides, one doesn't look at parlor maids as though they were people. We plan to drag him out into the road afterwards, bag the jewel case, telephone the police and get back to the hotel. I shouldn't like the poor young man to suffer, but Sir Henry didn't seem to think he would, did he? and she would be in the papers and everything and Cloud would see what she was really like. Mrs. Bantry sat down and groaned. Oh! My poor head! And all the time Jane Hellier, you deceitful girl! Telling us that story the way you did! I am a good actress, said Jane complacently. I always have been, whatever people choose to say. I didn't give myself away once, did I? Miss Marple was right, murmured Mrs. Bantry. The personal element. Oh, yes, the personal element. Jane, my good child, do you realize that theft is theft, and you might have been sent to prison? Well, none of you guessed, said Jane. Except Miss Marple. The worried expression returned to her face. Dolly, do you really think there are many like her? Frankly, I don't, said Mrs. Bantry. Jane sighed again. Still, one had better not risk it. And of course I should be in Netta's power that's true enough. She might turn against me or blackmail me or anything. She helped me think out the details and she professed to be devoted to me, but one never does know with women. No, I think Miss Marple was right. I had better not risk it. But, my dear, you have risked it. Oh, no, Jane opened her blue eyes very wide. Don't you understand? None of this has happened yet. I was well, trying it on the dog, so to speak. I don't profess to understand your theatrical slang, said Mrs. Bantry with dignity. Do you mean this is a future project not a past deed? I was going to do it this autumn in September. I don't know what to do now. And Jane Marple guessed actually guessed the truth and never told us, said Mrs. Bantry wrathfully. I think that was why she said that about women sticking together. She wouldn't give me away before the men. That was nice of her. I don't mind your knowing, Dolly. Well, give the idea up, Jane. I beg of you. I think I shall, murmured Miss Hellier. There might be other Miss Marples. The end.